Welcome everyone to Half History World Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and we are trucking right along with the life of Patrick Claiborne. When we last left him, the Confederate forces in Kentucky, guarding the state of Tennessee, had just pulled back below Nashville. Confederate generals Albert Sidney Johnston and Pierre Gustave Toutant Beauregard assembled a nearly 40,000 man force near Corinth, Mississippi, of which Claiborne was a part of. His brigade had grown, his own 1st Arkansas got renamed the 15th Arkansas, and the rest of his brigade was made up of Tennesseans and Mississippians. The 6th Mississippi, 2nd, 35th, 23rd, and 24th Tennessee. Claiborne protested the name change, but the 1st Arkansas title went to another unit. As the conglomeration of troops emerged from its encampment around Corinth, Mississippi, Hardy's Corps, which included Claiborne, was to take the lead in the advance on the Federals amassing at Pittsburgh Landing. At the end of the first day, Claiborne ordered his men to bivouac around a cool spring where the men could gather water and be prepared to move out the next day. Claiborne delivered some personal speeches to each regiment about the next 24 hours and bedded down for the night. He was supposed to resume his advance in the lead the next day, but found that Polk's corps had camped beside the road and prevented his troops from moving. Polk's men sluggishly moved to the side and Claiborne and the rest of Hardy's corps proceeded toward the landing. The Confederates marched so close to the Federal encampments that they could hear the bugles and drums from the Union soldiers preparing for morning drill. It would be Claiborne's men who encountered Federal cavalry and threw them back. This occurrence and others convinced Beauregard that the element of surprise had been lost, but Johnston wanted to continue with the plan to turn the Federal Army away from the Tennessee River and destroy them. Claiborne's brigade sat and waited, Orders would arrive to form up, and then another set of orders would arrive to tell them to stand down. The Confederate Army was having a difficult time assembling for an attack. Some commanders described it as chaos as regiments attempted to align themselves in the correct location. Claiborne's brigade had arrived first and had been in their assigned spot for a long time, waiting for their comrades to form. On the morning of April 6th, after two nights of sleeping on the damp ground, Claiborne ordered his men forward to launch the attack that would begin the Battle of Shiloh. Because he knew that coordination with the brigades to his right were of the utmost importance, he placed himself between the two regiments on the extreme right, the 6th Mississippi and the 23rd Tennessee. Almost immediately, he and his men encountered an obstacle, the Shiloh Branch. It had swollen from the previous rains, and what was left was a swampy area. As Claiborne urged his horse through the muddy terrain, the horse became spooked and threw the Irishman. He landed in the mud, but he was unhurt. He remounted and resolved that he would have to go around the swamp. The 6th Mississippi and the 23rd Tennessee went off to the right with Claiborne, and the rest of the brigade moved to the left. His brigade's punching power had been diminished, and the blue troops of William Tecumseh Sherman awaited him. After a couple of charges which battered both regiments, eliminating both regimental commanders, Claiborne then rode off to the left but those regiments were pinned down by a murderous fire from the enemy troops in their front. Seeing that he could do nothing in that sector, he rode back to the right. He then formed the remnants of the two regiments and assaulted the position. This time, because the regiments to his right had successfully turned the Union flank, the blue troops gave way. Again, he traversed the battlefield to see how his troops on the left were doing. He ordered what was left of his regiments to proceed forward and the men obeyed. They ran into a line of blue troops and fired away for about 30 minutes until the enemy line gave way. Claiborne wanted to pursue, but his men were out of ammunition. So he halted the regiments, and select men were chosen to carry ammunition boxes on their backs over a mile to the regiment, and once it was distributed, Claiborne advanced his brigade. The brigade numbered around 600 men. The casualties piled up in his regiments and continued to do so as the Irishman moved his troops forward. It was about dusk when he received word that Johnston had been killed and Beauregard had ordered a halt. Claiborne found an empty Federal tent and attempted to sleep, but the Federal gunboats launched shells into their midst during the hard rain. The explosive shells killed the wounded of both sides. Claiborne later wrote that history records few instances of more reckless inhumanity than this. By the morning, the brigade had about 800 effective men. The slightly wounded and men that lost contact with their companies had filled some of the ranks, but it was a far cry from the 2700 that Claiborne began with. Rumors and orders came to him informing the brigade commander that Federals were advancing and he formed up. The Confederate units were scattered from the hectic advance of the day before 
and Claiborne felt around blind to find another battle line to join. He found elements of Breckenridge's men, and he extended that line to the left. He could see Federals moving around to the left of his line about that same time, and orders came from General Bragg that an advance was to be made. He informed the adjutant that an advance would threaten the entire battle line, but the rider told him it was an order and he had to obey it. The Confederate line pressed onward through a dense smoke and forest. Claiborne would write, I could not see what was going on to my right or left, but my men were dropping all around before the fire of an unseen foe. This type of attack could not be sustained for long, and a general withdrawal was ordered. Claiborne harbored animosity for Bragg, who had ordered such an attack. As the Confederates retreated, Claiborne's brigade, now reduced to about 60 men due to the confusion of the withdrawal, which only left him with the remnants of the 15th Arkansas to command, was to act as the rear guard. He performed his duty well, but he was hindered by what he could do because of his small force. All in all, his brigade had lost 1,043 killed, wounded, and missing out of 2,750, nearly 38%, and the 6th Mississippi sustained one of the highest casualty rates of the entire war. The maimed army meandered its way south to Corinth. Claiborne, mounted on his horse with a captured sack of Yankee cornmeal around the pommel of his saddle, gnawed on a piece of Yankee hardtack softened by rainwater. Often the Irishman fell asleep in the saddle, only to be awakened by a lightning strike and thunder.